Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom Presents Carnage Week. And today we have a big episode. I have kind of a lot to go through, uh, so I'm going to do my best to do that. Uh, this is Maximum Carnage. And for those who don't know, uh, after Carnage's first appearance, people freaked out. Everyone was like, alright, we already loved Venom, but now we have this psychopath. Like, we have someone that really puts Venom in check. Is he really that bad of a guy compared to someone like Carnage? And yeah, Venom still has his problems, and he's still a bad guy for sure. Uh, but he has at least a streak of good in him. Carnage does not. He is the absence of good. He is total anarchy. And uh, and to see the symbiote now part of a serial killer is something really intense. You have this newborn baby, you know, alien creature that gets into the bloodstream of one of the most psychotic people in the Marvel Universe. And the blending of those two together, you slap those two in a blender and you get Carnage. And what we learn in Maximum Carnage is we get a little bit more of a peek at Cletus Cassidy's upbringing, kind of his early life. Uh, but we also see him just unhinged, completely unhinged. Uh, this was a 14-part crossover. The, basically, Marvel you know, was having such success with Spider-Man, the books were picking up. Uh, X-Men was also doing very good at the time, so there was like numerous X-Men books and numerous crossovers, and so they wanted to do that in the Spider-Man universe. So they came up with a story called Maximum Carnage. They're like, if we're going to bring Carnage back after his first appearance, we got to make it big. We got to make it nasty. We got to make it bloody. We got to do whatever we can. Uh, so that's what they do in this storyline, and it's it's super intense. Uh, but it is pretty simple to explain. Uh, 14 issues, you think this would be probably like a half hour episode, if not longer. Uh, but I could sum up the plot pretty well for you. Um, you know, Marvel at the time, they wanted to add another book to the Spider-Man like monthly schedule. So they had four books already, and they wanted to add Spider-Man Unlimited, which would come out maybe every two to three months, so not every month. Uh, but it would be like a giant-sized book. And to kick it off, they had the first issue be the first part of Maximum Carnage. And in Maximum Carnage, basically, we have, uh, you know, we have Cletus Cassidy. He's been captured after his, you know, the first time he broke out. He's, uh, you know, he's, uh, they don't know the extent of his powers. So they're transferring him from the vault, which is where, at that time in comics, all super criminals went to. Uh, even though they had breakouts all the freaking time. Uh, so it wasn't that good of a prison, it turns out. Uh, but they're transferring Cletus Cassidy. And, uh, you know, and they want to do some blood work on him and test him uh, because they might bring him to Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane. Uh, as far as they're concerned and as far as they know, the symbiote is dead. You know, he was fried with, you know, sound waves uh, at that concert and he went unconscious and they haven't seen him turn into carnage since. So according to them, he's, you know, kind of free of carnage and can be rehabilitated. Uh, but what little did they know is where carnage actually is when it's a part of of Cletus. They don't know that it's in his bloodstream. Uh, again, this is everyone, that was everyone's first encounter with him, and he acted differently than Venom. And so when they stopped him they and didn't see him, you know, return his carnage, they thought, okay, maybe we're safe from him, and now we can start, you know, peeling back the layers of the, the psycho, basically, that is Cletus Cassidy, uh, but try to rehabilitate him if we can, or see if we can rehabilitate him. But let's do some blood work first. So they go in, and they, you know, take some blood from him, and of course, by pricking him with the needle, a little bit of blood comes off his arm. You know, they take his blood, they walk off with it, but then he's like, no doctor, like I told you, there's a monster in my blood, and the blood starts to form, creates carnage, wraps around his hand, breaks him out, he's now free, and he kills all the scientists and everyone in the room, all the guards and everything. And and then once again, we have carnage on the loose. So uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting because you know these people just didn't know what to do. They were like, hey, we we don't know the extent of this thing's powers. Uh, they no one in their you know in their wildest imagination could have imagined uh, taking blood would you know awaken carnage again. Uh, so this is basically where they learn the extent of that power or that form of his power. Uh, so once the symbiote goes back in him, it retreats in there and it kind of, you know, heals like with the blood as, as his blood, you know, mutates and stuff and, and, uh, and replicates and, and cells, re, you know, are reborn and, and, and kind of heal themselves. Uh, so does the symbiote. And, uh, and then now it's ready to come out whenever you cut him or something. So, uh, so yeah, and Cletus is also learning, you know, this to an extent about his power. So, that's where the story starts off in Spider-Man Limited, and then pretty much from the rest of the story onward, it's it's kind of the same story. Uh, it's it's it starts off with Carnage when he breaks out, he finds a woman named Shriek, 
who has this like really insane power of like shooting these blasts. But we learn that that's not the only thing she can do with that power. Um, she can also do something else, which we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, and then after he breaks her out, he's like, all right, mommy and daddy meet. You know, he's kind of like another, he's like a psycho just like me. Like, let's go have some fun and paint the town red. And so they go out into the town together and that's where they stumble across Doppelganger, who's like this alien demonic creature, six armed creature version of Spider-Man. And there's been times in the comics where like Hobgoblin, had like a demonic form of him that became the Dima Goblin and Spider-Man like the you know the doppelganger is kind of that to Spider-Man in a way with a little bit of a different backstory um and so they meet doppelganger and Carnage is like hey let's adopt it and make it our kid and so it's basically Carnage going around and creating this surrogate family and you start to see why in the story uh, because basically as he's going around picking up all these different psychos to join his group he's having memories and stuff of his past as well and where he comes from and what we learn is that actually at a young age Cletus Cassidy tried to kill his or he did kill his grandmother uh, pushed her down the stairs she was in a, a wheelchair pushed her down the stairs and she died and then later tried to throw like a hair dryer plugged in into the tub to kill his own mother uh, and then when that failed his mother tried to then retaliate and kill him she's like you're a demon child i'm going to kill you and then cletus cassidy's father stepped in not knowing what was going on to defend his son and ended up killing his you know his mom his wife uh, you know so the so cletus's dad killed his own wife to protect Cletus, even though Cletus was the one that instigated all this. And then the dad went away for, you know, for, to jail for the crime. Uh, so it's almost like a, a twisted version of Barry Allen's backstory in a way. And, and Cletus Cassidy now, as a kid, gets taken to St. Estes, you know, school for boys, and he's an orphan. And, uh, and while at that school, he starts to, you know, systematically take out uh, bullies. He starts experiencing bullies and dealing with stuff there, makes a friend named Billy, who we'll learn about in another episode. And, uh, and then other kids that, you know, are mean to him, he starts learning how to take, you know, kill them without getting caught. And, uh, and this is the beginning of Cletus Cassidy. So from the get go, just a psychotic kid. And he goes off and, uh, you know, becomes the grown up serial killer that we all know him as, who then became cellmates with Eddie Brock. So you get a lot of backstory in this for Carnage uh, and Cletus Cassidy. And as he's, you know, developing this surrogate family and he pretty much, he gets Shriek, Doppelganger, he gets Demogoblin, uh, a, cre a creature guy named Carrion, who if he touches somebody, they wither up and die and they decay and they become old like instantly and die. And that like rejuvenates him a little bit. So uh, he has all this, like all these really terrible villains he's building an army with and meanwhile on the other side spider-man is building an army too uh he has to in a way and the first person he recruits is venom and he's like oh my god we have i have to team up with venom again after i betrayed him last time i have to once again team up with venom uh and then they also team up with black cat who has a problem at first teaming up with venom because he like broke her nose and beat her up in the amazing spider-man book so they have a bad past together and she doesn't want anything to do with him but she's like well we need him to kill carnage and i want to kill carnage and spider-man's like no we're not going to take life and both venom and black cat are like yes we are if we team up and we do this this one-time deal it's got to be to kill Carnage. And uh, Peter struggles with that through the whole book. That's kind of his journey in this book is trying to decide if Cletus is bad enough to kill. And if he doesn't kill him, is every blood spilled, every ounce of blood spilled after that from innocent lives, is that on Peter? And he's dealing with that like hardcore throughout this whole book. Meanwhile, he has Mary Jane, who's pretty much her only point. I guess she's the one character I kind of didn't like in this book. During the 90s, they, they did like some terrible stuff with Mary Jane in my opinion and they basically just made her the, the girlfriend who doesn't want Spider-Man you know Peter to be Spider-Man and so she just complained about it in every issue and most of her appearances in this book are just her sitting on the couch like in her underwear going like oh I, I wish Peter wouldn't be Spider-Man anymore and that's kind of like her only purpose uh, until towards the end then she actually has like a revelation of like okay Peter just saved some kids like children and you know on the news she saw it and she's like all right I'm gonna I'm gonna change my mind that like, you know i i see now like it's better to try to do something better uh, than if peter didn't do anything and i think she kind of learns that uh, message so this was kind of the part in the 90s where she kind of stopped complaining about him being spider-man so much and started to accept that the world needs him uh even though she i thought she knew that before but that's just an arc they you know try to go in with her and whatever it, it kind of works uh but the biggest thing she does is uh peter parker's dad is back in the picture and he you know he was captured he says he's still alive even though later we find out it's not really his dad uh but he says um you know like he was captured for 20 years and he used to believe in good people and uh you know and ben parker he was like you know uncle ben would have been here 
to help guide you the way Aunt May is trying to guide you and believe in the good in all the people. But I don't believe that anymore. I've been tortured for 20 years. Your mom and I have been tortured for 20 years. Um, I don't believe in that anymore. I don't believe in good people. And so Mary Jane later in the in the story, when Richard, uh, Peter's dad, uh, says that you know you know Peter doesn't need to be doing that doesn't need to be doing this kind of stuff and risking his life, Mary Jane defends Peter, and that's her turning point in the story. So she does have an arc in the story, although out of the fourteen issues, that's the only moment she really does anything. Every other part, uh, every other issue that she's in is just you know sitting on the couch and being mopey. Uh, but that aside. You have Spider-Man building his army with Venom, Black Hat. They also get uh, uh, Morbius, the living vampire. So it was cool. This is kind of when Morbius and Venom, like, first, you know, kind of see each other. Uh, so that was really neat to get that, like, buddy cop, you know, thing that I liked from the Enemy Within storyline to see that again here and kind of the origins of that. Uh, then they also recruit Nightwatch, who's, like, this guy that just um, kind of like a spawn-looking character that they created in the 90s for Marvel. And, uh, and he joins the team as well. And they also get Deathlock, Iron Fist, and then eventually Captain America. And that was really cool too, because remember at the end of the Carnage storyline, J. Jonah Jameson tells Peter, uh, or tells Spider-Man, you know, you're no Captain America. And, Ca and Spider-Man's like, yeah, I know. He, he, that guy's a legend. I'm just a man and I make mistakes and I have to live with those mistakes. Well, in this one, Captain America comes to Peter's aid because Peter's the only one on the team, that of his team, he's trying to, he's like, don't kill Carnage. Don't kill these bad guys. We just have to capture them. Like we have to be better than them and uh, and everyone else is turning against Peter uh, until Cap shows up and then Cap, Iron Fist um, and a couple of the others uh, you know decide to side with Peter and they don't want to kill anymore one of which is Firestar who is really cool because if you ever watched Spider-Man as Amazing Friends that was his roommate you know in that show him uh, her and Iceman were like his roommate she has fire power and Iceman has a uh, you know ice power obviously uh, so they were trying to get Human Torch on the team but they couldn't because you know the Fantastic Four and the Avengers at this point were off missing and doing different side missions and stuff so no one was in New York New York was left completely vulnerable for Carnage to pick apart just perfect timing on his part and then as we learned as I mentioned earlier Shriek has different powers she uses her powers as shooting these blasts and you know waves and everything and she distorts them to bring out everyone's rage, to bring out everyone's fear and ignorance and intolerance. And so what happens is not only does Carnage go around killing everyone, but New Yorkers are turning on each other and killing each other in the streets. And it's truly maximum carnage at this point. And uh, Spider-Man and you know the heroes have to go down and stop it, but because they were teamed up with, you know, Spider was teamed up with uh, Venom and Black Hat and these people that were willing to kill, uh, that didn't inspire people to change. It was only when Captain America showed up to work with Spider-Man and Deathlock and everyone, and they're like an Iron Fist, and they're out there being heroes, and they're giving people a second chance, and they're saving people that way, and using the light in them to do this. Uh, that was really great to see that turning point, and that's what got people to you know be unbrainwashed by Shriek. And then we also have the inclusion of uh, of Cloak and Dagger, who was really cool. They showed up very early on in the story, and then during a battle with Shriek. Dagger apparently dies like she gets hit with the blast she turns into pure light and explodes and uh, and we're like what happened to her you know when everyone's wondering what happened uh, meanwhile cloak her partner he can only teleport when she's around but with her gone he was still able to teleport so spider-man was trying to piece together what might be happening and so was you know cloak and then so there's a point in the story where all the others are fighting and cloak goes to a church uh, where where dagger disappeared and he's like something brought me to this church there's someone here like trying to speak to me and that's where he finds dagger still alive made of pure light and uh, and then he brings her to the battle at the end to bring the light back to the darkness to help you know reshape the new yorkers that are flipping out and some of the bad guys that are flipping out and they use her powers and firestar's powers to you know beat up uh, carnage shriek doppelganger and demo goblin and the whole crew and it was pretty great and then after everyone's defeated carnage is the only one that slips away and then that's when Spider-Man Limited 2, issue 2, the final issue, uh, is where Spider-Man and Venom go and battle Carnage. Uh, and they fight in this graveyard, and it's this really intense battle. Um, and again, Venom's like trying to kill Carnage, and Spider-Man's trying to stop him. And he's thinking of his dad's words about how there's no more good in people, and uh, and Spider-Man doesn't want to believe it. And he even wants partly to believe that there's some good in Eddie Brock. And he's trying to prevent Eddie from killing and making him cross over the line and becoming like a full-on villain in Peter's eyes again. He's like, there's time, there's a chance to redeem you, Eddie. You don't have to kill him. And uh, and Eddie's like, no, there's no redeeming me. Like, I have to do this. I have to be the one to kill Carnage. And then he grabs Carnage. They're in the, it's, you know, raining and stuff. And he jumps into a generator, electric generator. And they both seemingly explode. And Carnage uh, 
his body hits the ground, severely burned, damaged big time, uh, and Cletus is like laying there, protected mostly by the suit, but the suit is ripped in half and just you know almost destroyed obviously he comes back later uh but he's down on down and out for good and peter sees him and he's like all right well where's venom now and he looks around he can't find venom and eddie brock you know hops into the back of like a a truck as it's driving away and venom gets away that way you know healing in the back of the truck you know trying to put himself together uh leaving carnage with spider-man and being like hey maybe there is some good in me i didn't kill carnage but I think hopefully he's down and out this time, um, and hopefully I did the right thing. And uh, and that's kind of where the story ends with Peter walking off. Uh, you know, as the the Avengers show up with their Quinjet, uh, they show up and they're like finally there and they're capturing Carnage. They're putting him in a cell and locking him up and everything. And Peter is like, yeah, I, you know, he's walking away. He's walking between the tombstones of Norman Osborn and Harry Osborn because Harry recently in the comics died at this point, uh, died as the Green Goblin, but also died saving Peter Parker's life. And so it's him walking through and kind of reflecting on the ghosts of his own past because there was a point in the story where, um, where uh, you know, the light being, you know, they used like a Captain America brings this device from Stark Enterprises that kind of reverses, helps reverse some of the people in New York that are brainwashed, uh, the people that like, uh, you know, a dagger couldn't get to and, and things like that. And, uh, and that was also affecting the villains and it was making them remember things and, and feel feel like good emotions as well uh, so it was like this weird stark thing that like never got off the ground that they were like hey we could probably tweak this and use it to our advantage and so during that time cletus was having memories of everyone he's ever killed in the orphanage and he was starting to remember where he was and that building that was back in the uh, the, the origin story 361 through 363 that we talked about in the previous episode uh, in, in that that building where he was naked and he was holding the teddy bear, that was St. Estes, uh, you know, school for boys, the orphanage that he grew up in. So it kind of was linking all those things together and, and, and fleshing out, if you will, uh, the carnage backstory. Uh, so there was a lot of great moments in this, but again, it's pretty much just, you know, uh, new recruit on Carnage's side, and then the teams fight, and then the, the good guys lose. All right, the good guys recruit someone new. They get Deathlock now. They come back in, they fight, and then this the, the bad guys walk away. They get a new bad guy, and it's pretty much just like this tennis match uh, back and forth for 14 issues. Uh, but it is a lot of fun, and if you're out there and you want a really interesting look inside uh, you know, Cletus Cassidy, but also some beautiful art with some vicious fight scenes. That's pretty much just what this is. It's it's fight scene the movie. Uh, it is 14 issues for the most part of just, just carnage, it's literally, but it's the two teams fighting. You get to see all these heroes going up against each other, like Morbius and Death Watch versus like Doppelganger and Carry On. It's like, it's so crazy. And then to see Iron Fist show up in Captain America, it was really cool and to, to tie those threads into the previous run where they talked about you know captain america where peter mentioned them so it was really great if you haven't checked it out please do i think it's still in print i know it's definitely on comiXology and also on kindle so pick it up those places uh, but i believe it's still in print you can get it at your local comic store they could order it for you because it's a big hit i mean this thing maximum carnage was huge it, it became not just this comic book but it became a video game. And I'll have some footage playing here from the video game. And this is, I don't remember the YouTuber's name, but I'm gonna put a link to their channel down below. If you wanna watch their full playthrough, check it out. Uh, the game came out on the Super NES, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, and also the Sega. Uh, and the Sega console and the Super Nintendo both had red cartridges. It, I, it was a big deal back then uh, that they changed the color of this cartridge because that was limited edition. Because after they sold those red ones, they were just regular you know, gray and black cartridges after that. Uh, but yeah, this game was huge. It was, a, it was a big game. It was not only the first game that was a Spider-Man game that was rated T for teen and up uh, because of the violence in it, but it was also the first video game where you got to play as Venom, which was really, really cool. So a lot of people bought it for that reason because you could play, it was like it was like Streets of Rage with Spider-Man and Venom. So that was really cool. So there's some footage of that. Uh, there's also a band from the 90s called uh, Green Jelly who did this song called The Three Little Pigs, and that kind of was like their big hit. And then they went off to make a bunch of other music. They were hired to do the soundtrack for this game uh, called Carnage Rules was the name of the theme song. So I'll put a link to that down below as well. Some YouTuber was uh, nice enough to post it. So I'll put a link to their channel. You can listen to Carnage Rules by Green Jelly. It's pretty fun, uh, especially when I listen to it. I'm like, wow, that sounds totally like an early 90s song, but also very Green Jelly-like. If you ever had any of their albums, it's, it's perfect. Uh, so yeah, and they did the soundtrack to the game. Uh, and I think a Black Sabbath song or something showed up in the, the game as well, like in a 
you know 32 bit version or something but yeah this song was great so uh that was awesome and then also the last thing this game this uh this game but this comic book inspired besides the game and the soundtrack and getting like a you know a rock group to do the the soundtrack but it also inspired halloween horror nights uh so there was actually a time at halloween horror nights when they started that at universal studios where they did a, a night called maximum carnage and it was basically this creepy fun house of clowns and weird things that you could walk through at Halloween Horror Nights that was themed with Carnage. And when you walked into the entrance, you could see Carnage like on a hologram screen and he's, you know, like turning into the symbiote and looking at you and pointing at the audience and saying creepy stuff. So uh, I have footage of all this that are from other YouTubers. So if they're not, you know, they're playing here, but also check out the links. I'll put all the links down below so you can go see all that stuff for yourself. Uh, tell them the Venom Vlog sent you. Uh, some of them are older YouTubers. They don't post anymore, but uh, I'm glad they kept this footage up so that we could have it today. But yeah, Maximum Carnage, great series, inspired a lot of other events out of it. You know, it's it's pretty cool. And it was it was a big moment in the Spider-Man history. And it was also big because up until then, there weren't any Spider-Man characters created uh, since the Stan Lee days that had this kind of recognition. Like back when Dr. Octopus showed up in Vulture, like these were all new and exciting things. And then it was just Spider-Man fighting all those guys for, you know, 20 years. And everyone was kind of like... Okay, like what, what else, you know, what else do you got? And it wasn't until Venom and Carnage came along that uh, people really took notice. A lot of those uh, big Spider-Man fans of my age and, and maybe a little bit younger and a little bit older, all of them, maybe some of them got into Spider-Man because of these characters, because of Venom, because of Carnage, and they only have fond memories of those storylines and Maximum Carnage being one of them. But in rereading it, I was like, eh, it's a pretty simple story. It probably didn't need to be 14 issues, but the fact that it was uh, gave it room to breathe when they wanted to tell story moments, and it also gave the artists this ability to draw these amazing fight scenes. So for me, in that retrospect, I, I probably enjoyed a little bit more now uh, because now that I see it in that light, I'm like, all right, eh, it was, it was, I was like, yeah, the story's a little bit simpler than I remember. I thought this was a more complicated thing, but I see why it wasn't, and I see the joy in having it be like this big summer blockbuster. So I loved it. Hope you guys, too, if you've read this book, let me know your favorite part if you played the game. Anything to do with Maximum Carnage out there, let me know down in the comments below. I really appreciate the feedback. Thank you so much for watching my channel. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.